young voices, big issues. Join us as we explore the real power of Youth Rising. Youth Rising. Youth Rising. The Youth Rising podcast by NCS. Hey, this is Youth Rising by NCS, where young people raise their voice to make a positive difference together. We're the podcast for young people, made by young people. And in this series, we're looking at the issues that are most important to our generation. I'm Eleanor Ray, and in this week's episode, we're looking at the relationship between sport and mental health. The Youth Rising Podcast by NCS. It is undeniable that exercise is good for our health, both mentally and physically, with medical professionals promoting it as being a hugely beneficial well-being practice, citing purpose, discipline and a release of serotonin as things you can gain from picking up a racket or even just lacing up trainers. But there can be a less positive flip side. When we compete and push ourselves to the extreme and to be the best we can be, participating in sport can go from being good for your mental health to a pressure that can cause real psychological damage, trigger anxiety attacks and send some of the greatest names in sport into depressions that alter the course of their careers. Yeah, I say um, put mental health first. First, first, first. The ECB says Stokes has withdrawn from England's test squad to prioritise his mental well-being. I love like the exercise element of it and feeling strong, feeling empowered. It helps me deal with stress. I mean, athletics has always been my happy place. And that was the biggest turning point was that like, I can make this change. I can become me again, I can be the normal Jack Law, and I can be amazing again. You heard there Simone Biles, a clip from ITV News, Charlie Webster, Kadena Cox and Jack Law, who we'll be hearing from in a minute. The Youth Rising Podcast by NCS. Our generation is more vocal than ever about the significance of prioritising your mental health. And this has been reflected in the advocacy of Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka and many other young sports stars who have bravely spoken up about the effect of the industry on their mental health. So while it is important that we celebrate and educate ourselves on the undeniable benefits of participating in sport, we are also aware of the need to have honest and open conversations about how, for some, their mental health has also been compromised. Papa Dikart spoke to Olympic gold, silver and bronze medalist Jack Law about his incredible achievements, not only in his field, but also in overcoming his anxiety and low self-confidence. Hi Jack, welcome to the Youth Rising Podcast. We're delighted to have you here to chat with us about sport and mental health. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited. We've done our research and you're a really accomplished Olympic medalist. So when did you realise you had a talent for it? So I started diving when I was seven years old. Always been in water my whole life. I was swimming, I think, from the age of three. And my mum and dad were really keen to get me into some sort of sport just to get me active really and just to enjoy being active in any sort of sport really. I used to do swimming, gymnastics, diving, rugby and um, I just kind of enjoyed diving so much. I loved the the thought of throwing myself up a board and doing somersaults. I also kind of enjoyed, you know, being at school and being able to do a backflip. I thought that was really cool. It wasn't until I was about maybe 13 or 14 when I started winning quite a lot of things and started going to international competitions and started doing well that I actually realised that Maybe I'm cut out for this. Maybe this is a thing that's actually, you know, my calling. Maybe this is my destiny kind of thing. So it did take quite a while, but, you know, all that time I was still really, really enjoying it. So for me, I was just doing it because I loved it. Never really thinking about it as a, uh, a potential future career, but here I am now. That's really cool. I have a friend who dives, so I've seen the, like, the intense work she puts into it, and that's really impressive that you've gone so far with that. <laughs> Thank you. So you won the gold in the 2016 olympics can you tell us what that was like yeah me and my synchro partner we were the first people ever to compete in the synchronized event uh, people have done it individually but only you know a handful of people in the entire history of diving and we were the first people ever to do it together and we went into the olympics after the world championships the year before we got a bronze medal and it was our first major medal that we would got together so we were really happy with that and we didn't expect to win as it were 
and the, there was a few curveballs. I don't know if you can remember. There was the the green diving pool. It was outdoors as well in in Rio. So it was it was like a really weird kind of Olympics and one we probably won't experience again, where there were quite different conditions to a normal regular diving pool. And it just so happened that me and my synchro partner really enjoyed that, and we had a great competition. And on the day, we were the best. You know, the Olympics is a really funny thing, especially in diving because diving is such an inconsistent sport and one day you can be the best in the entire world and the very next day you can be you know 15 20 ranks down and it just so happened that on the day me and my synchro partner had prepared perfectly and got that olympic gold medal and when we won i can just remember looking up at the crowd and just thinking i cannot believe we've actually done this i mean that's amazing the fact that you've progressed so far so in 2021 you won a bronze if i'm correct in saying that yeah and you said that was the one you were most proud of yeah it felt like it was the one that i had to overcome the most adversity to get there I had a real setback in 2019, which really affected me personally uh, and my diving career, but also mentally as well, which is the biggest thing when you stand on that diving board is that you're mentally strong. And after that, my mental state was in a really, really bad way. And I found it really difficult to get back on the horse and keep going and keep working towards that Olympic Games. Um, and to be honest with you, you know, when COVID hit and the Olympics was cancelled and postponed a year, it was actually for me, it was a really positive thing. It just gave me an extra year just to try and just get back to a place that I was comfortable to compete again. And after going through what was essentially, the you know, a really bad two years post-2019 to get an Olympic medal when only a couple of months before I was in such a terrible place at the European Championships, which is the very final competition before the Olympic Games, I was in a terrible place still. And then to get over that and to come home 14 GB with another medal and to complete the set of gold, silver and bronze, it just was overwhelming. It really was. It was the one that I was most proud of and felt like I'd achieved the most with. I know it's not the gold medal that everybody wants, but for me, it was the one that meant the most because it was overcoming so many mental challenges for me. And um, I think that one will always stick with me and will be a defining moment in my career that I'll look back on and just be always so proud of it. That bronze medal is just as valuable as any other medal, considering the work you put into it. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about that loss of confidence? Where do you think it came from and what put you in such a dark headspace? Yeah, I mean, it was a 2019 World Championships in uh, Guangzhou, South Korea. Basically, in diving, it's the rest of the world versus China because that's how good they are in the sport. So I was diving better than them and I was beating them. And in the last round, I think I was about 30 points ahead of my competition, which is a huge gap in diving. And the final dive was one that I, nine times out of 10, do very well. And that one time out of 10, I don't do it well. It's not too bad. You know, it's enough. But this time, for some reason, something just went wrong. I don't know why. It's like when I was spinning around, I just didn't know where I was in space anymore. And that's so crucial to diving is to know exactly where you are. So you kick out of your shape in the correct place. I kicked in the complete wrong area, landed flat on my back. You know, I was about to win my first ever world championship gold medal. I've never been a world champion. I've been every other champion apart from a world champion. And for me, it was such a huge thing. And the one that I was you know, so excited to become a world champion, finally, something I've wanted all my life. And then to have it taken away and to not understand why as well. That's the other problem was that it was the first time it's ever happened. And it completely spooked me. And I kind of just put it in a, a box and just put it to the side straight away and just kind of like tried to forget about it and move on. The problem kept persisting when I came back to training and it really ground me down to, you know, I was frustrated at training um, and it ended up getting to a point where it's all I could think about. You know, before I went to bed, um, I'd wake up in the middle of the night sometimes thinking about it, having bad dreams about it. And then that slowly progressed onto the fact that I didn't want to be at the pool anymore. I had anxiety about going towards this dive and trying to do the skills around it. Ended up hating diving, basically, because my entire life revolved around this one thing that was going wrong, but I didn't understand why. And... It ended up just putting me in such a terrible place and one that I really hope that I never go to again. And I feel like I've overcome a lot of those challenges, but those scars still are there today with me and I still carry them and still struggle with things in in a mental aspect. And I think that the help that I've had has been amazing, but there's still such a way to go for me to be able to recover and become the person that I was five years ago and hopefully even be in a better mental headspace than I was then. But all that expectation and then to have it come crashing down on the biggest scale for me was just too much it was just too much trauma in one and I could I just couldn't recover from it I didn't I didn't recover in the correct way and I struggled and I hurt myself trying to get to the bottom of it because at the time you know I felt like diving was the only thing that defined me 
And when it's going wrong, the, the one thing that defines you, when it's not going right, that's a really, really difficult thing to get your head around. And yeah, it, it crushed me. But that's why that Olympic bronze in Tokyo means more than any other. Because I've never been in that position before where I've had to dig myself from the lowest depth to come back again. What advice would you give to anyone suffering with anxiety or struggling to find joy in what they used to love? A couple of things is one, try and get help. And that can be professional help, but just talking to peers, friends, family, and being open with people about how you're feeling. I think that just talking about it and getting it off your chest is the first step. For me, goal setting has helped me quite a lot. And, I, you know, it's not huge, huge goals. Um, sometimes for people that are really struggling, it can be really, really minute, small things that you can just tick off. Uh, I think that it gives a, a real sense of satisfaction, being able to tick something off that's just a small thing. And just, um, you know, for me, it's it's worked really well. So yeah, I'd say those are my three things is get talking to people around you and your support network. For me, goal setting was a very personal one. And then number three is to actually seek out real professional help because I feel like it can unlock who you're truly meant to be. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great talking to you. Thank you for having me. What we did at the Our Youth Rising team got together to discuss the impact participating in sport has on them personally. So I play cricket and football and I often go to football back to campus after going home and it's really cold and freezing but I always end up enjoying it after I come back from football and bouncing off the walls. I annoy my flatmates so much with that. I don't know what you guys feel about that. Yeah, I feel the same. So I do cheerleading and we literally throw people around in the air and sometimes they might step on you or they fall on you and as much as you're like oh my god I can't believe that I fell or they hit me or whatever you just leave and you just go oh my god but we did so well I feel like team or individual whether it's running or swimming or cheerleading or football or rugby we all are part of a community in some way I know for me especially it's definitely like having a second family and sometimes I feel like I spend more time with them than my actual family Although I play a team sport, within the team, you know, you always want to be the one that scores that first try or scores the winning try and makes the penalty kick. There is also that competitive. So I do it as well. Like I, I know that, you know, there's a Harley Quinn scout on the side and I'm trying to impress her. So I want to run with the ball and I want to be the one to score, even though I can clearly see that my friend behind me is open and ready. And I think that's one of the downsides of sports and sort of that like selfish gene that all human encompass. With, with the like body stuff, I, I think one of the reasons why I really like rugby is because you've got different shapes and sizes on rugby. You've got the smallest person on the team weaving through people and the biggest person clearing a pathway. And I think that's one of the things I really like about rugby that, you know, there's no one size for everyone. Whereas in like most sports, like sometimes they're like dance or ballet or something like that. You know, you have to look a certain way. But in rugby, as long as you can hold a ball and run, like that's fine. They don't care what, how tall you are, how short you are. And that was one of the comforts of knowing that I can walk into my change room, get changed. No one's judging me for how I look or like how I'm dressed or whatever. And that was one of the key differences that made me choose rugby and stay with rugby throughout secondary school. That's interesting. All of these people, when we, when we talk about these things, it's all about creating a safe space for people. When we grow up, creating that safe space, especially because it's such a huge period of like transition for everyone. Um, if we'd all had that safe space, I think we'd all enjoy sport a lot more. CJ spoke to sport journalist, presenter and host of My Sporting Mind podcast, Charlie Webster, about how we maintain a healthy balance between pushing and looking after ourselves. Welcome to the Youth Rising podcast. So you've endorsed the benefits that sports can have on our mental health and also spoken publicly about how it can be related to depression and anxiety. And you've also interviewed so many athletes, covered so many matches, fixtures, tournaments and Olympic events. Do you think it's safe to say that you're like a sports lover? Like, what do you love the most about sports and like getting involved in it? Well, thanks for having me, CJ. It's a real pleasure. And I feel honoured to be on here and to be able to talk about this with you because it's something that I'm so passionate about. I would say, yes, I'm a sports lover. I think you summed it up. But you know what I love about sport is actually the human side of it and the community side of it. So I love the fact that 
you know, it brings people together. You know, the other day I joined this volleyball group and I don't play volleyball and I ended up staying for like hours and meeting new people. So I love the community aspect of it. But personally for me, I love like the exercise element of it and feeling strong, feeling empowered. It helps me deal with stress, mental health, my day. Like yesterday I had a really full on day. Like I think the perception of what I do or what people do in this industry is as if it's is a lot harder than people understand and very very long hours and I went for a run last night I did some weights and it just made such a difference to be able to shed all the stress and any feelings that I was dealing with and so to me that's what sport is and when I was a young age I don't think I would be alive now talking to you if I didn't have sport in my life from a young age and the reason being is I really lacked a lot of self-worth I had a lot of difficulties at home a lot of trauma and being part of a running group gave me a family that I felt was quite fragmented for me when I was younger it made me feel like I was worth something it made me feel like I was good at something and it helped me deal with depression which I had as a teenager and I still have now And to me, the things I learned through doing sport as a teenager, I use every day now to help me in my life. Say like after a long, stressful day, how do you find it in yourself to then sort of like put on sports gear and just go on and do that? Because I feel like for a lot of people, it'd be a lot easier to just sit down, watch a bit of Netflix and then just like eat something really bad and just go to sleep after that? That is such a good question. I'm so (laughs) glad you've asked me that because I do do that sometimes. And I think that's important to recognize because we're, I think at the moment, especially with social media and as a woman, you're like, you've got to be everything. You've got to do everything. You've got to look a certain way you've got to achieve a certain way while you know having relationships having family um and going to the gym and and being healthy and and we've only got 24 hours in a day and I think also it's important let me just say this is I think sport gets a negative rap whereas like exercise is so important and there is a difference between sport and exercise and I think it's important you don't have to be this amazing runner or and I'm using running because I run a lot or you have to be this amazing football player and I think you can just do it your way you're your own athlete no matter what you do where even if it's walking around the block that's what's right for you so I think that's really important to distinguish and in terms of watching Netflix and eating some bad food the most important thing to not do is hate on yourself for doing that because as soon as you hate on yourself you won't go out for a run the next day because all it is is a self-perpetuating cycle where you'll feel even worse about yourself let me tell you I love running I love sport I love exercise so much I could do any exercise I love it it uplifts me so much but I do that Netflix and eat crap food as well. So obviously sports can put you under quite extreme mental and physical stress. You yourself have like contracted malaria um, whilst completing a bike ride to Rio, which is quite cool, but like kind of scary at the same time. Um, How can we maintain a healthy balance between pushing ourselves and looking after ourselves as well? You know, I find myself talking a lot about the benefits of sport and exercise, but at the same time, I do have to be careful and because of the way my brain works I'm definitely somebody who's a real perfectionist which I'm very aware of and I think the main thing is being aware of what your drive is and where that comes from because to me that used to come from a lack of self-worth because I never felt I was good enough and so that got into my sport and exercise where I would push and I push and I remember the bike ride which you mentioned which cycled from London to Brazil which is I agree with you it's kind of cool but also crazy and then and then I ended up critically ill in a coma on a, li- a live support machine so it's definitely like a double-edged sword for me where I'm like wow I had this amazing experience and oh no it nearly killed me and you know I still struggle mentally with that now because it was so traumatizing and changed my life But I did another challenge um, in 2014 where I ran down the country. So I ran 250 miles um, for women's aid. 
And I was basically trying to raise awareness or I was raising awareness within the sports football community about domestic and sexual abuse. My mum was concerned and she said to a friend of hers, oh, you know, I'm concerned, you know, about my daughter doing this 250 miles. And my friend was like, well, what's the worst that can happen other than her stopping and not being able to do it? And my mum went, you don't know my daughter, she won't stop. That's the problem. And that's sometimes something I have to be aware of is that I won't stop. And when I was doing that 250 miles, I remember, you know, I got injured early on. I ended up having like some gastro problems and ripped my shin on the first day. And I was doing this for seven days. And I still, and I ended up one night in hospital because I'd swollen so much. And I look back now and I'm like, wow, like I felt this immense pressure about what I was representing. I felt like I can't fail. And if I didn't do it, it would be a failure. Whereas it wasn't because if I hadn't been able to do it, would I rather risk my life to not be able to do it? And I was still raising the awareness, which was ultimately the most important thing, not completing 250 miles, but raising the awareness and raising money for women's aid. And when I was younger, when I was a teenager, I would train part of this running group and then I would train outside of the running group. It helped me deal with depression and the trauma I felt and the lack of self-worth, but that became very addictive because I felt better emotionally when I ran. So it became so addictive. So again, it's that, it, it's that real fine line of, especially when you've got anxiety, you can use the gym as a tool all the time. So I think it's just really important to be aware why you're doing something and what you're feeling and understand that it's a fine line. But I think that comes from getting to know yourself and being really honest with yourself about how you're feeling. Do you think that's something that you've like gotten better at like now? Oh yeah, absolutely. But that's because I've done a lot of work on my own mental health and I've again looked at myself and gone, what's going on? What are you feeling? And try and identify the emotion. Okay, I'm feeling sad, just say. So, you know, what, what's making you feel sad? Oh, you know, X, Y, Z. Okay, so what would be a healthy thing to do for that? Is it to reach out to somebody? Is it to sit with your emotion about why you feel sad? Is it to go, you know, and just get yourself out, get some fresh air? Is it to go and do exercise and start to identify those things? And for me, I do that a lot. And the more I do that, the more I get comfortable with my own emotions and how I feel and don't beat myself up or be hypercritical, because I used to be hypercritical. And that's got a lot better. I mean, it sometimes still creeps in, but it's got, it's got a lot better. It sometimes creeps in if I feel vulnerable or I'm working on a huge project that sets me out of the comfort zone, but I recognize it. And then because of that, I manage my coping mechanisms better. So I do use exercise as a coping mechanism, but I also now have alternative coping mechanisms. And so that's how I have a much healthier relationship with sport and exercise. Thank you so much for coming on today, though, to talk about this stuff. It's been very interesting. And you've definitely opened my mind about sports and like putting your mind first and whilst doing sports. And yeah, I've really, really enjoyed this interview. So thank you so much for coming on today. Well, thanks for having me, CJ. It's a real pleasure. How can we help? In this section, we look at ways we can give back to ourselves and to the community based on the episode topic. This week, we heard from Erin Williams at Stonewall about the amazing work they've been doing with their Rainbow Laces campaign. And from the head of youth services, Kaylee Harris at Sport in Mind, who spoke to us about the incredible sport workshops they do with young people to help with mental health struggles. And if this episode has got you inspired, you can learn how you can get involved and make a difference. Hi, my name is Erin Williams from Stonewall, and my job title is Sport Programs Manager. What does Stonewall do? So we are Europe's largest LGBTQ plus charity, and we work across schools, across colleges, across workplaces, across sport to help change the law and change culture to ensure that all LGBTQ plus people in the UK and globally are free to be ourselves, um, to live our best lives, and free of discrimination. Rainbow Laces campaign started in 2016, and it's a nationwide, it's a global-wide chance for people to celebrate 
uh, LGBTQ plus people who play sport to show their support for people who play sport and to really take a look at at how we can all win together. Our tagline is to lace up and speak up. So we have rainbow laces and we want everybody to put them in and then start the conversation and say, actually, hey, I've got an LGBTQ plus teammate. How can I make life better for them? Or, hey, I want to learn a little bit more about what identities are like or Actually, we want to challenge this policy that's not allowing my friends to play sport. And let's make sure that we can get homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia out of sport. Um, so how can young people get involved in the Rainbow Laces campaign? We say just get go online, come to stonewall.co.uk forward slash Rainbow Laces, and you can order your pair of laces. If you play for a school or a community team, um, you can get a discount. You can get everybody else wearing them together. And we have laces for all different identities. So we have you our standard rainbow ones, and then we have lesbian laces, non-binary laces, trans laces, bi laces, pan laces and ace flag laces as well so no matter who you are we hope that you're represented there get your laces on whether or not you're an ally or you're supporting your friends or you are lgbtq plus yourself get the laces and then get involved have the conversations if you don't feel safe starting the conversation maybe speak to a teacher or a coach or a friend and then you do it together you know get involved and say hey this isn't just for lgbtq plus people a big part of it is allies so straight and cis people who are not lgbtq plus who can actually really lead the way and say we really want to stand up for everyone because the more people play sport and the more people who have the opportunity to win the better Hello, I'm Katie Harris, the co-founder and youth manager here at Sport in Mind, a charity that uses sport and physical activity to support people's mental health. In particular, Sport in Mind delivers a youth program that was co-designed last year with children and young people and mental health professionals. It covers off many different aspects of why sport and activity is so important to us including a suite of PHSE lesson plans for secondary schools to really understand the benefits of being active for our mental health and well-being. If people are interested in getting involved as a volunteer at Sport in Mind, they can get in touch with us through our website, which is sportinmind.org. The Youth Rising Podcast by NCS. Runo spoke to Paralympian presenter and celebrity MasterChef winner Kadena Cox OBE about how her mental health had been affected by the change in direction of her sporting career and her eating disorder. Good afternoon, Kadena. I'm Runa. Welcome to Youth Rising Podcast. Thank you for having me. You've spoken publicly about the need to slow down reflect and check in on your mental health and this is really courageous I don't know about anyone else I think it is and I'm really excited to speak to you today about your relationship with sports and mental health but just before that I looked through your Instagram and saw you won Celebrity MasterChef which was amazing so how do you think the competition of sport mentally prepared you for that experience? They always say that sports people do really well on that show uh, just because we have that competitive edge and I just think we don't know how to turn it off (laughs) like if you're an athlete like that competitiveness is just installed in you and also just because I feel like as an athlete I quite like pushing the boundaries and I did that within my food. So moving on to the sports side of things obviously you're a brilliant athlete you've won two gold medals for both cycling at the Olympics in Tokyo 2020 obviously sport and exercise is so good for your mental health and physical well-being how would you say that's given you access to feel those endorphins when you're in your moment, when you're running or you're cycling? I mean, athletics has always been my happy place. I was an athlete from a real young age and I just think it's always been my kind of place to escape. I am one of seven children, so the house is always a madhouse um, and sport was just my thing and it just gave me like that buzz and that boost and I can, you know, be feeling really like down and just, you know, get up and do a session and feel better like jump on my turbo my bike in the living room and just you know yeah just like it picks you up and I think people underestimate that and I guess as well when you win medals it also makes you feel a lot better I mean you say it makes you feel a little bit better I was doing some reading (laughs) and you're the first British Paralympian for over like 30 years to win medals for two different sports that's a massive achievement I'm 
like fangirling over here. Anyways, so you were diagnosed with MS in 2014 and started the Paralympics afterwards. How did you process the shift from being an able-bodied athlete to being a parasport athlete? You know, I'll be honest, it was tough. I think the hardest thing for me was I went from being, you know, just an average able-bodied athlete that was working their way up through the ranks to then being a very different version of myself like my body totally changed my speed totally changed and I was trying to find my way back into something that I loved and I I used sport as a way to get me through the hard times like honestly I wouldn't have got through kind of my diagnosis and the real like tough times if it wasn't for sport and you know having that goal but it came at a cost like I really struggled with dealing with the fact that I was so much slower and like my body just wasn't doing what I wanted yet still I was high ranked in the world and I felt like I should be happy about it but I just wanted to be the older version of me that was faster and you know she wasn't you know world number one but I was happy at that point. So I really struggled with that kind of change from able-bodied to Paralympic in athletics. And I think actually having cycling alongside has really helped that because cycling I'd never done. So there's no comparison. But I was going to retire from athletics. Like I genuinely was going to retire um, after the World Championships. I'd made my first World Championships team and was basically asked to make a decision between the two sports because at that point you couldn't be elite in two sports. Uh, okay <laughs> um, but I um, I decided I was going to do cycling because like I say mentally I was dealing with that one a bit better and then I went to my first world champs kind of went into like my warm-up and was like prepping and just remembered why I loved athletics and why I loved what I did just like going through like major championships like enjoying like the buzz of the competition like I was literally just like okay I can't quit this sport I absolutely love it still <laughs> that's brilliant Sometimes the pressure to be the best can be really overwhelming. And so with that, how do you continue to break records without it having a negative effect on your well-being? I'll be honest, and I'm always honest. It has taken me years to figure that out. I keep telling everyone I'm in my 30s now, so I'm an old lady. Um, but with that comes wisdom. And I think in terms of my competitors, I, I have that on my side. It took me a long while to figure out where my mental health sat because for me it was just I've got to be the best version of me and there wasn't just the external pressure, there was the internal pressure. When I got ill, like sport became my life and that was kind of my lifeline. I'm like, now I just need to make sure it stays good because this is what got me through. So then for it to actually then turn into a negative just seemed so bizarre. And mentally, I really struggled. If you stop me enough, you'll be aware of the fact that I have an eating disorder. And that really was something that creeped up on me without me realising. And I actually didn't realise I had a problem for a really long time. And I think just doing anything to be the best sometimes can be destructive. And I think sometimes you need to be able to take a step back and figure out what's important to you um, and kind of realise that sport is amazing it can give you something, but it can also take away from you. I have great psychiatrists and psychologists who have done a lot of work with me and got me to a place where I've kind of figured out that, like, yes, sport is amazing and, like, me going well in my sport's important. But my psychiatrist is always like, yes, I want you to go well, but he's like, the most important thing to me is you as just a human being. So it's taken me a long time to be able to separate myself from my sport. And I think that's the problem that I had, you know, when I got ill... I became my sport, like I'd lost myself, you know, having been diagnosed with MS, I felt like I lost Kadena. Sport is like, you know, one corner of me. But on top of that, you know, you've got Kadena, the Christian, you've got you've got Kadena, the baker, uh, the Kadena, the physio. And there's so many more strings to my boat. And I think, you know, figuring out that, yes, sport is amazing, but, you know, family, you know, lifestyle, all those other things are just as good. And it's just finding that real fine balance. Well, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you today. You've inspired me a lot. And um, I I wish you the best for whatever you decide to do. And uh, good luck in the future. Thank you. It's been great speaking to you. Each week, we're getting our guests to recommend a book that has helped to educate and inspire them on our episode topic. This week's books are... 
My book recommendation on the Youth Rising podcast is Achieve the Impossible by Gregory White. For me, it's about achieving goals and being able to try and maximise your potential as a person uh, and for me as an athlete. I found it really helpful and quite inspiring. And uh, for me, it really helped. The book I'd recommend is called Born to Run by Christopher McDougall. And on the title page, it says the hidden tribe, the ultra runners and the greatest race the world has ever seen. Whether you like running or not, you'll love it. My recommendation for the Youth Rising reading list is The Mamba Mentality, How I Play by Kobe Bryant. And I think Kobe was just an amazing player and the strength that he had, you know, to be the Mamba. Some of the other kind of the gems that he gives you in that book are pretty amazing um, and have helped me with my career. So yeah, go have a read. And here at the Youth Rising team, we recommend Mindset, a mental guide for sport by Jackie Reedon and Hans Deckers. This book describes a new way of thinking in sport and helps you understand how to convert anger, impatience, tension and frustration into self-confidence, better focus and more pleasure. Join us again next week for our final episode when we look at relationships and ask, how do you find your people? Remember to rate, review and follow Youth Rising wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check out our socials at NCS on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat and YouTube. I'm Eleanor Ray. Thank you to CJ, Runo, Papadika, Halim and Sophie for their help on this episode. And of course, to our guests, Jack, Charlie, Kadina, Erin and Kaylee. If any of the issues raised in this episode have affected you, you can find free support and advice for under 25s at themix.org.uk. This was a Something Else production for NCS where young people turn no you can't into no we can young voices big issues join us as we explore the real power of youth rising youth rising the youth rising podcast by ncs